Hey, in this video, I'm going to answer the question, can you actually cure hip arthritis and avoid replacement surgery? We get this question on our channel all the time, and the quick answer is yes, for most cases. There are some cases out there that are just too far gone, and a hip replacement surgery is going to be the best thing for that individual. But in reality, less than 10% of hip arthritis cases that we see here in our clinic do we actually send out for an orthopedic surgical consult. The majority of them, more than nine out of 10, will actually do just fine and they'll, they'll heal naturally with our natural treatment options. In this video, I'm going to explain how that works, how the hip arthritis can heal naturally and why the healthcare industry as a whole generally pushes people towards getting hip replacement surgery way too soon when they possibly could avoid it. My name is Dr. David Midoff and I'm a specialist physical therapist at El Paso Manual Physical Therapy. And this channel is dedicated to helping people stay healthy, active, and mobile while avoiding unnecessary surgery, injections, and pain medications. Please consider subscribing to our channel so that you don't miss out on any of the helpful videos we post every single week. So first, let's just get this straight. What is hip arthritis? I'm talking about osteoarthritis, which means the joint is where the arthritis is. And it's not related to other types of arthritis like psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. There's also juvenile arthritis. And there's other hip problems out there like hip dysplasia, which does set up hip osteoarthritis. But if you've had hip dysplasia in the past, and you're dealing with hip arthritis now because you're older, or it's been around for a little while longer, this isn't gonna apply to you. I'm talking about good old fashioned hip osteoarthritis, which is what the majority of people with hip problems related to chronic pain, that's what they suffer from. So to explain hip arthritis, here's a hip joint in the skeleton. There's a ball and there's a socket, and that ball should move in the socket to do all the movements that you've got to do for your daily activities. But what happens in hip osteoarthritis is the surfaces of the joints are too pressed against each other. There's too much pressure in the area for a long period of time. You have to understand that joints are designed to take pressure. That's why you stand on this joint, you, you put pressure through it. But when you're putting pressure on it inappropriately, in, in a way that it's not designed to take those pressures, then that's when you get an adaptation that is a, a bad adaptation it's, and it's usually arthritis. So the first thing that typically happens is the cartilage on the ball wears down. Also the cartilage in the socket wears down. Other injuries might happen like a labrum tear. There's a chunk of cartilage around the socket here called the labrum. And when this keeps going on over months and years, even decades, um, and you get enough cartilage worn down, you might have an X-ray where they show the joint spacing and if it's decreased, they'll start to say you have osteoarthritis in your hip. Or if you get an MRI, then they can see more clearly the cartilage surfaces and better diagnose your hip osteoarthritis. Now, everything I've said up to this point is what a general doctor would tell you or a healthcare professional, a physical therapist. But what I'm gonna say next is not common knowledge and isn't something that you'll probably get at a physical therapist or doctor's office if you're being seen for your hip problem. The reason for the excessive pressures in a hip joint that set up hip arthritis is that there's muscle imbalances that begin to move that ball off center from the socket where it's supposed to be so that you can get the best motion. And if you have that ball say too far up, too far forward, too far rotated inwards, and you live and move like that, then you're going to be irritating the tissues right where there's too much pressure. You're not distributing the forces throughout the entire ball and throughout the entire so socket, so you're focusing it in one area, and it's just rubbing way too much in that area. And the reason that, that it pulls in that direction is usually because the muscles on the front of the hip, like your hip flexors, your quad muscles, the muscles on the front of the thigh are too dominant or strong, and the muscles on the back of the hip are too weak. The most common muscle imbalance we see is that ball goes forward on the socket, causing the front edge of the ball right here to wear down and then the inner part of the socket to wear down right there. And associated with that, we see people with very tight hip flexors, tight quad muscles, and then no glute muscles or very weak glute muscles in the back. Hamstrings might be compensating as well, but typically you see a loss of butt muscle. And when we get our clients in here that are a little older in age, you know, I'm talking like 50 and up, um, that's still young in my opinion, but 
uh, once they're hitting 60s and 70s for sure, you see them not have a butt. And when we see our, our ladies that are more voluptuous, a little more curvy, that might have you know some curves back there, the muscles just are not functioning very well and they can't use them effectively to pull that ball into the socket correctly and get proper movement going through the hip joint. Now let's answer the question, how does hip cartilage heal? So the way that you undo this problem is simply by taking those pressures off the hip joint. If you take the pressure off the cartilage within the hip joint, then you give it a chance to rehydrate, to get water back in the tissues. You give the, the tissue itself a chance to heal. You get the fluid within the joint, the synovial fluid or joint fluid, to nourish the inside of the cartilage and give it enough time, which it does go slow compared to like muscle or skin tissue, cartilage tissue just has a very low blood supply and a low metabolism, meaning the cells don't operate very fast. They, they, they work at snail pace rather than rabbit pace. Versus like if you cut your skin or you get a muscle injury, you're healing quick within days or, or weeks um, for a more severe injury. Cartilage just takes a long time and you have to take that pressure off over a long period of time. Another important aspect of this is that you need to do the right exercises. Going back to that muscle imbalance where the muscles on the front of the hip are too strong or dominant. I, I use the word strong and or dominant because you might already be strong and not consider yourself to be a weak person, especially if you've been more active or fit throughout your life. And what I'm talking about is a dominance then in that case where you are more dominant in the, in the muscles in the front. Even though you have strong glutes, the, the balance between the, the glutes on the back of the hip and the hip flexors and quad muscles in the front of the hip are a lot, it's a lot more strong on the front, meaning this is more dominant and you're less dominant in the back, which generates a relative weakness. But if you admittedly say, well, I'm not the strongest person in the world. I haven't really worked out that much over the past years, decades, since high school, since my younger years, um, then you probably don't have a problem saying, yeah, I got weak glutes, so what? And the fact of the matter here is not about embarrassment. It's, it's figure out where you're at, figure out what your problem is, and start working from there. If you know that your glutes are weak or, or you have a, an imbalance where your quads and hip flexors are more dominant, that's where you got to work next. I'm going to come back to what you should be doing next by the end of this video. But next, I want to answer the question of why did the doctor recommend that you get a hip replacement at this time if there's a possibility that you can heal this problem? And let me tell you the facts. Most doctors training. So let me just go into some of the, the, the background here. Physicians. When I'm talking about doctors, I'm talking about physicians. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. There's doctors of nursing out there. There's all kinds of doctorate level degrees. And that just means you've gone through so much education. But when we talk about doctors generally, we're talking about physicians, which are doctors of medicine. They may go through extra training to become surgeons, neurosurgeons, pediatricians, orthopedists, all the different specialties that you hear about. What you need to know is that most doctors of medicine are trained in medicine. So they're thinking about how to help your hip problem using medicine. And then their friends that have gone into orthopedic residencies and surgical residencies, those are who they think of to refer to. So whenever they don't have success helping your hip arthritis with an injection or with some sort of pain medication, then the next thing they think of is, oh, uh, my buddy down the street who's an orthopedic surgeon um, can help you out with hip replacement surgery. Let's send you that way. And then orthopedic surgeons are trained in doing surgery. They do. They can probably do it with their eyes closed. I mean, I'm joking, but they do that stuff all the time. They're very good at it. And the fact of the matter is that if you do have to have a hip replacement surgery, they're done pretty well these days. Your chances are that you're going to have a good outcome. Uh, of course, you do open yourself up to risks of infection and dislocation, and there's there's all kinds of issues that can happen. And my biggest concern, which I harp on this channel tons, is that if you don't fix that underlying muscle imbalance before you get a hip replacement surgery or any replacement surgery or any surgery for that matter, then you're going to have that imbalance after you have your surgery, which is going to set you up for a similar problem or a problem at a joint nearby. If you still have that dominant hip flexor and, and quad muscle, it's just a matter of time before your knee starts to bother you or your back or your other hip or other knee starts to bother you or the joint that you had replaced if you had a hip replacement starts to become loose and you have issues with that. What is unusual, what is not talked about a lot is how to help prevent surgery. That's just not what surgeons do. Of course, 
you know, it doesn't pay as much um, as surgery does. There's all kinds of people involved, you know, the, the prosthetists, the people that are making the surgical uh, parts that go in your body, the replacement parts. Um, if you've ever been to a surgery room or heard of it, there's tons of people in the room and everybody's got to get paid, the hospital. There's, there's a lot of money to be made in surgery. I'm not saying that that's why your surgeon is recommending surgery. They're probably trained to do that, like I said, um, but that's where a lot of people are trained. People like myself that talk about preventing surgery, there's just not many of us. Um, and there, it's just not talked about a lot because it's not a big money making thing. So not a lot of people go into it. But I want you to know that it's just not common knowledge in the medical field. Now with physical therapists, because you might have seen a physical therapist who told you, yeah, go ahead and get a hip replacement surgery. You might as well. You're already of age and you, need, you might as well enjoy the rest of your life. Why suffer for the next 5, 10, 15 years with your hip just getting worse and worse and worse? I hear this all the time. And here's my answer to that. Being a physical therapist myself and going through physical therapy school myself, I can tell you, I've taught in physical therapy school as well. The requirement for somebody coming out of physical therapy school is not that you can prevent surgery. It's that you know how to handle somebody who's had surgery. So physical therapists generally, all their general skills and knowledge are best geared towards helping somebody who's just had a hip replacement surgery or, or some other surgery like that. They are excellent. If you've had a hip replacement surgery, you need to be in physical therapy likely right afterwards, as long as your doctor told you and, and when to tell you and all that. But they're not the greatest as a whole at preventing getting a hip replacement surgery if you qualify, if you're, if you're the type of person that can do it, which most are. So if you're looking for a healthcare expert out there to help you, you got to do some digging. You got to look at their training and their credentials. You got to look high and low to make sure that you have a person that's got the right training to help you out. Now, let's answer the question, what should I do next? Let's bring it full circle. And it ties back to, you know, who do you find to get help for your hip arthritis right now? Most of the time, that muscle imbalance that I've been talking about is the main thing that's causing the hip arthritis that's progressing you towards needing a hip replacement surgery. We've got exercises here on our channel specifically showing you where to start exercising if you've got a hip arthritis problem. The video's linked down in the description below. We've also got an entire playlist that, we've, that we're working on that's got hip arthritis videos. So there's a bunch of content on there already also linked below for hip arthritis. We've got tons more content coming your way. So if you haven't subscribed already, do so now so you don't miss those videos when they come out. And give us a thumbs up if you thought this video was helpful for you. And don't forget to share it with somebody that needs to hear this. I know you probably know somebody out there who's thinking about getting a hip replacement or maybe already had one on one side and they're thinking about the next one. They need to see this video to see if it's possible for them to escape having surgery. And one last thing that I'll leave you with, if you're trying diligently to prevent this hip surgery from happening and you've given it its due time, you've given it you know weeks, you've done the exercises, months even, you've seen a few people, you've tried a bunch of things, you're not in bad shape if you decide to go get a hip replacement. You, you probably will do good. Most people do good. There's a great success rate for it. Just find yourself a good surgeon. Look in the area. You might travel to a bigger city. That's my best advice to you if you do have to have the hip replacements. Thanks so much, friends, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.